Welcome to the debrief of debate number three. Where do the best insights come from? Do they come from lab studies or do they come from field studies? We had several experts again on the panel who talked about their opinions. We started off with Professor Itamar Simonson, who is a professor at Stanford. Uh, Itamar, by the way, is, is best known for his work on the compromise effect. If you re recall the three coffee cups that we looked at uh, in the first week, that was his work. Um, Itamar had this to say. He said, well-designed lab studies have clear advantages over uh, field experiments. We next had Owen Service uh, from the Behavioral Insights team in the United Kingdom, uh, who actually went the other way. And Owen started off by saying uh, that he firmly believes that field studies add more insight than lab studies. Alison Shu joined us. She's a former colleague of mine here at Rotman. Uh, Alison's comments again favored lab studies over uh, the field because the lab gives you a bigger sense of control. Uh, Professor Nina Majar, another colleague of mine, uh, also favor, well, actually favored the field instead of the lab uh, because uh, she was talking more about studying impact of our interventions in the real world. And then finally, Geeta Johar, who is an associate dean uh, at Columbia University, uh, favored the lab. And so we had, uh, you know, uh, three people who favored the lab, two people who favored uh, the field, and if we look at what reasons they gave, the people who favored the lab were all about control, control, and control, whereas people that favored the field talked about relevance, they talked about ecological validity, they talked about real-world applications. It was uh, 21 years ago that I was a doctoral student at the University of Chicago uh, and I was taking my exams in the behavioral sciences, my comprehensive exams, and this was actually one of the questions that was asked to me. Why would you use a field study? When would you use uh, a lab study? And so as you can tell, I've been thinking about this problem for a long time. And here's where it all culminates. So as I think about this problem, and I think about science more generally, I actually make the argument that there are four distinct stages of the scientific process. The first stage is what I call discovery. Discovery essentially means the phase where you go out and document new findings, new insights. Uh, mental accounting. Uh, the first papers written by Richard Thaler were papers where he simply presented a lot of data and he discovered the field of mental accounting. The second stage is a theory test. Once you've discovered a phenomena, once you've shown that it happens in multiple conditions, multiple settings, you want to then understand why it happens. What's the underlying psychology? What causes the effect? What's the mediator? What's the moderator? And so that's phase two. In phase three, uh, in particular with relevance to the topic that we are covering, uh, we might want to start thinking about interventions to address that particular phenomena. We'll call this the, the design stage of the choice architecture, the nudging stage. Right? We think about multiple nudges we could come up with that, that you know, might change the behavior. And then finally, phase four, we want to go out and test that nudge in the field. Does it work? What sort of effect sizes do we get? Does it, does it have a big effect? Does it have a small effect? Uh, and so when we start thinking about each of these four stages, discovery, theory testing, uh, the design phase of the nudge, and the efficacy, we can start making connections between each of these stages and the kind of methodology that is best suited for each stage. Now think about discovery. Uh, how do we actually go and discover phenomena? We go out to the real world, uh, we observe people's behavior, we try and recreate that behavior in a lab, uh, we perhaps try and do field, field studies, we try and document evidence uh, from real world settings. Uh, and so if you're looking at a phase of discovery, uh, then field settings might actually be very good. Lab settings help to confirm what you find in the field, uh, but a discovery uh, process is more about field. It's more about observation. It's more about uh, demonstrating facts uh, repeatedly. And if you can do that both in the field and the lab, uh, that is actually a stronger demonstration of your effect. Let's think about theory. Now, when you're testing theory, things become a little bit trickier. Control becomes a lot more important. You want to be able to show that there is one precise variable that affects the other one. And you could never get that in the field. Because in the field, as we've seen, many things co-vary at the same time. 
You could have people who are different on income, but they might also be different in terms of other factors, where they live or how big their families are uh, or their consumption patterns. And so it's impossible to uniquely isolate one factor at a time in the field. You can do that in the lab. And so if you're looking at theory testing, the lab is a much safer place. It's a much better place. You can apply very strong tests of theories in the lab that you can never do uh, in the field. Designing nudges is again a stage that is, is particularly well suited for the lab. And the reason I bring it up is that when we think about the nudge design process, we are probably thinking about 5, 10, 15, lots of different interventions that we want to try. It would simply be very expensive to run them in the field. And so designing nudges are again best done in a lab. They're best done in a design studio. They're best done using tools like usability testing or, or small controlled experiments. And once you're down to one or two little interventions that you want to test, that's when you want to go to the field. That's when you want to do a test of efficacy. You want to see which one has the, has the biggest effect. And when we think about what all of our panelists were saying, um, both Alison and Itamar and also Gita Johar uh, were essentially making the point that labs are good for testing theory. If you go back uh, to, their, to their commentary, they were really talking about testing theory. They were really talking about the idea that you can isolate uh, different variables, whereas both Nina and Owen were talking about both discovery and efficacy. Owen talked about uh, effect sizes, which one works best under what conditions. You can actually test all of that very well in the field because now we're in the efficacy uh, side of the process. So in conclusion, uh, the key question is, what is your goal? Right. Is your goal to test theory? Is your goal to document a new phenomena? Or is it to test the efficacy of a nudge? And depending on your goal, uh, your answer is either the lab or the field. Uh, and if you look at uh, the best academic projects, you look at papers that are published in the Journal of Consumer Research or the Journal of Marketing Research, uh, to me, the best ones are the ones that do a little bit of both. They're papers that show uh, a theory that's developed in the lab, but then they show the implication of the theory in the real world. There are others that start off with a field study, they document a phenomena, bring it to the lab, and then start testing out and teasing apart uh, the theory. Uh, and in sum, uh, I don't think we can ever live in the world where you only do field experiments or you only do uh, lab. Good science requires both of them. <laughs>